What's up everybody? Welcome back to Make It Custom. I'm Carl Fisher. Today we are back on the 1939 Lincoln Zephyr four-door to two-door chopped coupe conversion. Um, this car is something that, uh, it's my personal dream car, so I'm trying to make it into my vision of having a chopped three-window coupe. Um, so right now we've done the windshield, the A pillars. I started on the B pillars and uh, in the comments on the first video that we dropped in a long time, we did these A pillars and there was some discussion in there about welding the inside structure of the car. The way cars are built, um, or the way this car is built and most uh, American vehicles, they all have structured door frames and then outer sheet metal. So when you chop a car like this, if you just chop it and weld it all together, you're welding the inside um, structure, but there is also an inside structure that is directly underneath the outer skin that you cannot weld. Now this is something that I would say nine and a half out of 10 cars that get chopped, they do not weld just that one line that is unattainable without opening the skin up. So this is what was happening in the comments. So we're gonna take care of that today and something that I've been thinking about as well. A lot of people that I see doing really good quality, amazing kind of coach built chops, they go the extra mile as to opening it up and welding all the structures. And it does make the car safer. Like that's the structure of the car, right? So um, it's not to be taken lightly, I suppose. So that's what we're gonna do. And uh, while we're at it, because there is a cut here, a cut here, and a cut here to chop and tip pillars in, these welds, I would hate to have, you know, I've got one, two, three welds plus the seam right now. That's four welds in this pillar. That's kind of a lot. So I think what we can do and what a lot of people do is you metal shape a piece that eliminates all those welds. You just have that one kind of perimeter, nice TIG weld that we can put our metal shaped piece in. It will also eliminate the lead joint. This is where the factory panel was attached. So there's a lead joint right here. And that is what this gobbledygook is. My weld is actually lower. My weld is disappeared, it's down here. But that lead joint, we can also get rid of at the same time. So we're gonna kill a bunch of birds with one stones with this video today. And uh, don't forget to like, click subscribe, hit notifications. Let's do this A-pillar. Okay, first things first, we are going to get the rest of the lead out of there. So I'm just gonna use a propane torch and a wire brush. We're just gonna melt the rest of this lead. There's actually like, there's quite a bit. Okay, it's probably good enough. Man, it's so ugly under there. Like, I'd below it looks kind of nice, but look at that. That is ugly. You can see the diff on it and everything. Like. Cave and pave. Cave and pave. Okay, so in order to do this shape, uh, first things first, we're gonna take a paper pattern. I'm gonna use magnets, I'm gonna use this thin paper. This is just packing paper, basic Home Depot stuff. And the paper is gonna give us an idea of what shape we need to put into that piece. Mm -hmm. 
So let's just get a little bit closer to what size paper we need. Just rubbing my fingers on the drip rail here. Gonna have a look at where the paper is gonna stop. I want to eliminate this weld. It looks like the weld is right there. So we'll probably come on the outside of the weld. Somewhere there. The weld comes up to what looks to be here area. So we'll call that. Call that that. You can already see where this is. I think that should be good. We'll call that, we'll call that something. We'll test fit that paper again once we give it a trim. <laughs> Is it upside down? No, it can't be upside down. It looks upside down to me. It was upside down. Your face. <laughs> I'm just pulling it tight and just gonna put some magnets along like the kind of the highlight, or like the, the top of this shape, you know, like the, it slowly curves down there. So that's gonna need a little bit of shape, but we're just putting magnets on the top. Just holding it tight. I would say there's not a, a ton of shape in this piece, like the actual like shrink and stretch. I don't think there's a ton. It feels like there's gonna be a little bit of stretch here. When I try and bring this over, it tightens up, tightens up this edge. So I think that the, the shape of it reverse curving a little bit this way will mean that we'll have a little bit of stretch happening in these spots. Actually, maybe not here. This actually feels, feels like it's just a roll. See how the paper is nice and tight? Paper's nice and tight to the pillar there. That's telling me that this is mostly just kind of a two-dimensional roll. You can push the paper down, it means that no, no shape is in it. It didn't wrinkle or it didn't get tight. So that's just form. And then up here, we've got a couple different things going on because this starts flowing. It starts about here where this, uh, what do they call that? Flare. Um, there's like a drip rail, it's like a wind, I don't know, there's like a drip rail name for it, but anyway, that drip, drip rail kind of uh, recess, that's starting to happen, so that's also making this into a bit of a reverse curve, because it's curving this way, but it's also curving like that, so there'll be some, you can actually feel it right here with the paper. If I were to cut this, which I probably do, this is what the paper's telling you when, when you use it, right? If I put a cut in here and push this paper down, see how it widened out? Now that this pushed down, it's because that's the dip of this. So it needed a little bit of stretch here to allow the paper to do what it wanted to do. So now I'm gonna show you over here. We'll put a couple magnets like this. And you see how now this wants to wrinkle? See that? These little wrinkles happening. That's what the paper wants to do to allow the paper to come down in that area. You can see exactly how much shrink needs to happen. It's always good to have a, 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 as good of a paper pattern as you can. Like any, any time spent here is, is time saved in all other areas, I believe. Let's transfer it to some 18 gauge sheet metal and start making a pillar.
All right, do we get another one out of that? Nope, nope. You wanna just set up the timer? <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, now we got our pieces cut. I cut two because the other side's gonna be the same. Uh, which side are we working on right now? This is this, this is this. So now I, I, I just wanna transfer my notes from the paper pattern onto this. So we've got, um, you know, we're gonna have to do a little bit of stretching in here. And we are going to have a few shrinks in this area. I'm gonna evenly put the shrinks in. We'll do like this. Shrinks, one little stretch. And then we've got a little bit of stretching happening kind of in that area. And this is somewhat of a roll that rolls, um, as you remember. And then we've also got a roll kind of going down here as well. That's gonna change as we as we go, but let's start off by putting in a few little shrinks and a couple stretches, just by hand. I'm actually gonna give this a quick wipe because I, I, I notice now that, uh, well, these original wrinkle lines were more accurate to what it needs. And where I just put a bunch of lines through here, that's not where that's not where the roll is going to be, so I'm just going to wipe those off real quick. Where's the peak of this? And kind of how does it come through here? It seems like it kind of goes throughout the whole thing. Put peaks here. This is, a, this is a roll on the whole thing. And then we've got a little bit of a flat here and the, the radius is a little bit tighter here. So that's just kind of what I was marking with that. So we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna tuck these, stretch, stretch. Actually, I'm gonna have to mark these on the back side. If you haven't seen this before, this is the uh, Mother Tucker hammer. This is just a nylon headed tucking hammer. I use it a lot. Uh, I use it in conjunction with this tucking stump that uh, we've designed. It's got a nylon plate on this side. It's made of lumber. There are other stumps that are like this that are out there, but we just sell a kit to make this one. Um, the half inch nylon plate is actually quite um, crucial because I use it to, to knock the edge into a tuck, which is what I'm about to do now. To do a deliberate tuck, I'll, I'll start it, I'll tell it exactly where to start. So the tuck starts right where I want it. See how it's wrinkling like that? That's telling you it's shrinking. Come back onto the nylon. Hammer it back out. We've already got a bit of shape happening there. That was actually quite a bit, so I'm hoping that it's not too much, but. Pops the tuck exactly where you want it. Just kind of run it out inside the bowl here. The shape of the bowl is opposing the angle of the tuck. So when the tuck peaks like this and the bowl is holding it this way and you press down, that is the bowl pushing against the angles of the tuck to push the metal together. It is physically getting thicker when you tuck. That's how you are shrinking, is you're shrinking 
the material and, and it has to go somewhere so it gets thicker. Okay, we got one more tuck here. I make that little peak in the metal using the edge of the nylon. Hammer down. The wrinkles on the edge are showing you that it is shrinking as well as the amount of shape that we're getting. The other beautiful thing about the nylon is that the hammer and the plate both have a good grip strength so that when you're hammering a piece of metal, it wants to grip it. It doesn't want to slip. Some plastics like Delrin and other uh, drometers of plastic, they might have different chemicals in them that make them slip either for sliding or things like that. Nylon has grip strength. So um, that's one of its good characteristics. The other thing I like about this is that it bounces. So like when I'm planishing this out or smoothing it out, um, I'm allowing, you know, the squish of this slightly softer material to help actually smooth this out. And I'm not working too hard because it's able to bounce. Okay, so this spot here is where we said we need to have a little bit of stretch because this is gonna kind of turn up into the drip rail. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over to this slightly flatter dolly and I'm gonna use my shark head hammer. That's this one. Basically it's just um, for stretching, it's, it's linear stretching. When I pinch an area between a shaped hammer and a dolly like that, the material is gonna wanna push that way and that way, so I'm stretching it. You saw how much um, stretch really needed to happen. It wasn't really a, a ton. So um, we're just gonna do a bunch and see, see where we're at. You can see that piece dropping. Okay, got a little bit of stretch there. Now remember we have to stretch a little bit at the bottom edge of the pillar to allow it to flow right here. Let's have a look. Now keep in mind, none of this is gonna fit right now because we don't have any form in this. We're just, we're just looking at this spot on the car because there's a slight, a very, very slight crown this way and the reverse curve going this way. That's why we need just a little bit of stretch to allow this area to flow. So I'm gonna do the same thing, shark hit the hammer, put a little bit of stretch in there. These are things that we wouldn't know to do precisely without using that paper pattern. So paper pattern first. Okay, see that wave that we've created in there? That means that we've got some stretch in there. It means that there's more material here than there is here. So it had to go somewhere. So it started creating that wave. That's evidence of your stretch. Okay. Next is this line. I, I checked with the uh, radius gauge to see what radius this tightened up to. So let's have a look here. So, I mean, things are relatively, they're relatively flat in this area. You know, there's a little bit of that curve that we're talking about. So what do we have? Like, that's a little bit harsher than that. Maybe a four, a four at that spot there until the gauge lifts off. You know, then a little further down, it's a six, about there. Um, and then it gets even flatter. But what I'm talking about is this. What's the peak of that? So uh, is it three? No. Is it two? Kind of, but right in the peak of it. Yeah, it's about a two. I'd call that a two. So two tapering up to whatever this is. So it's in between a six and a 12, so it's probably about an eight. Um, so that means that we're about an eight radius by the time we get up here, and we're about a two at the bottom. Um, and then when there's just a little bit happening here. So we're gonna go to the English wheel. Oh, let's bring our radius gauge. It 
If you don't have a rubber band for your English wheel, then you can use tape. I used to use tape all the time. I would just like sit here with a roll of duct tape or masking tape and I would just fill it up. Just something soft on your wheel to allow no stretch to happen, but to allow that lower anvil to imprint its radius into your metal with a smooth backer. It's something that you're gonna have to um, you know, push through a bunch of times. You don't have to have rubber. An inner tube works fine. A wheelbarrow tire tube, uh, if you cut a slice of that, that also works. Um, sometimes if you cut an inner tube one and you allow it to stretch so that it actually lips over the edge of your wheel, I've been told that that helps it stay on. There's a little bit of fighting that happens. Like if you're way too tight, your, your rubber is just gonna fall off immediately. Um, <clears throat> so it's not, uh, it's not always perfect unless you have a friend to make you a vulcanized rubber wheel. That's going, gonna go on. I think I'm gonna get another English wheel to put this on because then we'll have one for forming, one for stretching. I didn't check this. I didn't check this die yet. This radius, what do we got here? Okay, that's way too shallow. What is this? There, there's a two. It's our sharpest wheel. Or should we start a little lighter? It, what did I say, it went to a four? We'll go over the whole thing with the four and then we'll, we'll go a little bit sharper to make that graduated roll. Okay, so that's pretty light pressure. Get a little bit more. Whenever you're using a rubber getting form, um, unlike when you're not using the rubber, you do want to run right off the edge because you want the edge to bend also. When you're not using a rubber and you're trying to bring up a shape, you're leaving a frame around the outside of your panel that you're not touching with the wheel because it's what's gonna contain the shape that you're growing. Um, whereas when you're forming, you wanna run right off the edge. If you're just forming the center and not the edge, you're gonna have a weird transition. Okay, we're starting to look like something here. Got a little bit of form happening, but it's very uniform right now where it needs to tighten up on this corner. So I'm gonna go to a sharper lower anvil. So with the three, I'm just gonna work, you know, from here down. We're going to number two. All right, now, without checking it quite yet, because we know there's a couple other things that have to happen, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna flare this out a little bit because we know it needs it. I'm just kind of holding up a little bit. See, and that, that came out and the wave left immediately as soon as it came out because it had extra material it needed to use up. So our curve this way, now reverse curving, got to use that material. Well, this is the spot where our drip rail is happening. So give it the curve. Okay, let's have a check. Ok, 
Okay, I think that I do have to do a little bit more work with the English wheel here. And I think that I do need to trim this shape. And I do think that we're gonna have to shrink this edge. It tucks in there a little bit. Okay, I think more, more bend right in this spot will help us fit it for sure. So we're gonna go back on the English wheel. Okay, let's have a look here. I think also because we've got this curve happening, some shrinking is gonna have to happen on this edge. You can see how it's kind of getting wavy as we're getting it closer in form. We've got a little bit of a wave happening, so the kick shrinker is gonna be able to tighten a little bit of that up. That's kind of what I'm thinking right now anyway. How far down does this go? Okay, as of right now, I definitely have too much shrink in this area. That, that, that shrinking stump just, just definitely uh, did do a bunch of work. I'm not trying to take all of it out, but just some of it. Just try and knock a little bit of that down. Okay. See where we're at? Yeah, world of difference. World of difference. Okay, it looks like that shrinking is gonna come into play now, so I'm gonna do a little bit of shrinks on this edge. Okay, so that definitely helped. Uh, we still have a little bit of a ways to go to get this to tuck in. Might be a little bit of form here. Definitely getting closer. Then, you know, whenever I'm checking as well, I'm always, I'm always pushing on it. If I can't see the backside, I'm pushing on it and visually looking for where is it where is it tight to next? You know, and right now it feels like it's tight to there. So from there over, I need to, I need to bring this shape down. What action can I take to bring that shape down? If I shrink a little bit more right here, it would bring that shape down. So I'm gonna shrink a little bit there. I'm kind of doing a heavy one and then a couple of smaller ones. What is our next step here? Um, I'd like to bring this in. Um, I can just push and bend that in, but where I'm seeing it's touching right now is right here along this line. I do believe that as we flared this out, this bit of it should be flared out as well to bring the shape down. It seems like it's getting hung up right on that edge. Yeah. So we'll do a little bit more stretching in this area. Okay, so I'd stretch that a little bit, and then I was gonna roll a little bit more here. Okay, I think also because of the nature of this shape, you might need to be a little bit of shrinking here. So we've got a bit of a curve on it. Just a little bit of light, light shrinking. Okay, we're getting closer. It still needs to bend a bit. I'm just kind of hitting in the valley of that reverse. Okay, there's a bit of stretch in there. Just gonna knock it up a little bit. Okay, now we should be able to get the necessary bend in it. Okay, we're getting closer for sure. I'm gonna take out some of this, some of that that we had a little bit too much. 
Okay, flatten that out. I'm just going to adjust this a little bit, make this a little bit nicer. I don't know if I helped it at all. <laughs> I kind of forgot where I was at. We still need a bit of a bend this way. Yeah, we're getting pretty close. Yeah, we're getting pretty close. Well, close enough to take a lunch break, hey, Elio? I'd say so. All right, so now that this thing is fitting relatively decent, we're gonna mess it all up again by trying to smooth it all out. Um, so what I'm looking for is that this relaxed fits nice and tight everywhere. So it, it's pretty good right now. We've got some kind of um, wrinkles and stuff in here and there's a little bit more shape that could go into it. So now kind of, it's the fine tuning stage. So we can planish it now. You could either go to an English wheel and smooth it out with the English wheel. You could go to a planishing hammer, smooth it out with a planishing hammer, or you could just do this by hand, hammer and dolly style. Um, I guess we'll do a little bit of both we've used the english wheel a little bit let's go uh let's do a little bit just by hand so when you're doing something like this by hand you want to use the flattest hammer you have uh, that would be a planishing hammer you could even use like soft hammers as well um, i mean it definitely works but typically you would just use like a nice smooth faced hammer. These are the ones that you polish uh, because it does transfer the imprint of it. And so if this is the last hammer that's going to be touching the material, you want it to be the smoothest. And you always want to choose your dolly to be the right curve or as close to the curve as possible. So if whatever radius I've got here, I'd want to match it to a dolly, say this radius or this radius, which I think this radius is probably the closest right here. So when you're planishing, you want as much surface area touching the dolly as possible, and that's gonna help it smooth out. All right, well, that is a bit of hand planishing with just a flat headed planishing hammer on the dolly. Let's go have a look at how far this thing went out of whack while we were <laughs> messing with it. <laughs> Not too bad actually, so it's just, a, it just gained a little bit of a twist. There we go. Okay. She's looking good. She's looking good. Let's check that out. Okay, I'm just gonna mark an exact tracing on the back side of the Sharpie so that we've got, you know, a perfect kind of window frame line. Now, I'm not exactly sure 
how to do this. Cause I'm not, I don't want to go the entire length of, of wrapping this entire edge. I don't think that's something I want to do. I think I'd rather weld on the edge and just kind of smooth it out. But to get, you know, the back break and then it breaks again for it to be this actual piece, that's just too much. So I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna just trim this out and then just roll the edge kind of halfway through that radius. And that I think is where I'm gonna weld it just cause I think it's a, a relatively simple place to line up and weld. Um, yeah, so now I've got my tracing on the back side. I think that's exactly where I'm gonna cut it to be honest. And then just, we'll just start rolling it over. Now we've got our Clico holes. We'll be able to check it each time. There's my cuts. Probably just do this one by hand. I think that that cutter would maybe mess it up. Okay, double check our existence here. We're looking nice, we're looking nice. Okay, next step is to roll this slightly over. We're gonna have to do so on a T-dolly, which is just a piece of round bar welded to a piece of flat bar. If you don't have T-dollies, you can just make one. Um, the other thing that we need to consider here is that this windshield is relatively flat this way, right? But because of the nature of this curve, as we're curving the sheet metal over, it's going to want to stretch because it's curving this way, right? And we're rolling this way. So it's essentially like, like another reverse curve. So this material is going to want to stretch. So as you're hitting it on the dolly itself, it's okay to hit it hard closer to the edge, especially in the radiuses. The straighter this line, if we're rolling that over, there's not gonna be any stretch really needing to happen. We're just forming a roll. But as soon as it takes on a roll and a curve, a two-dimensional curve, then we have to start thinking about whether or not it's stretching or shrinking to be able to do what it needs to do. So. I like to know where things are happening so that I can kind of help them along. Whereas on this, I might not hit the edge of the sheet metal on the T-Dolly so much, but on this corner, I might hit it a lot more because it is okay to hit it so much so that it helps it stretch. Uh, hopefully that makes sense, but those are the things that help me make shapes. So I'm just gonna use a T-Dolly like this, just a rounded T-Dolly. Gonna chuck it in a vise, this little vise right here. Okay, we should go have a look, see how we're progressing. Not too bad. Really not too bad. I'm actually tempted to just, like I feel like that edge is so strong it could take a little bit of this. Maybe not so much, no. Okay. Well, I think that uh, it's a little bit softer of a curve than what we've got going on. So we might have to just soften this a little bit and maybe start it a little bit further in. It looks to me like this radius comes to about there. It's a little bit closer to this highlight line than it is this one. So I think we need to just keep working. Okay, 
now that we have hand planished this piece and it is fitting quite nicely, I just went over this with the planishing hammer and the dollies and I actually tried to take out some of those deep grooves that were from that linear stretch hammer. And what you got to understand about metal is like Ray Shaleen, um, check out his channel, Pro Shaper Workshop, he says metal is clay and he's right, it's soft. So it's actually taking the imprint of the hammerhead. So a bunch of really short, tiny hits and you're kind of erasing the deep grooves that were set up by the, that harsher hammer. So I, I did go around and that's what planishing is. It's just finding a dolly for the backside that is very close to what the shape is so that your dolly is backing on all the lows in the bumps and then you're hitting the top with a bunch of hits to just try and hit the highs down against the lows and it just evens it out. That's what planishing is. So that's why like a planishing hammer is advantageous because a planishing hammer will hit, you know, four or five, 6,000 times a second, or sorry, per minute. Um, so saves a little bit of, uh, of the arm, but, but really this didn't take long, okay? Like I think this whole piece actual time, you guys are always asking me how much time I have into it. I'm probably two hours of on the tools to make this piece. Not terrible, there's still a little bit more work to go, but, um, but that's what it takes to do it by hand. So I think next I'm just going to, going to um, I guess, I don't know, I'll just sand it so that you guys can see what it looks like sanded. I'm also interested to see what it looks like sanded, put the piece on. It's not perfect by any means, it's very close. It's what we call on Make It Custom 100% good enough, um, where there's not gonna be a lot of filler in that piece. And it's certainly miles better than it ever was as a leaded joint from the factory. So. I'm just gonna do a little 80 grit. I mean, look at that. Like, that, those are all our hammer marks. Like, that's where we were hitting it in the tucking stump, you know? Like, two seconds and the marks are almost gone. So, I'm just gonna go over this whole thing. We'll have a look at it. Funny how like much better things look when they're just like like five minutes of sanding, you know? There she is. Gobbledy goop. New piece. Finished out all right. I'm very happy with it. Um, excited to get these actually put in, you guys. So uh, thanks for all the people that commented, encouraging to do this next part of the chop. It is kind of um, taking it to another level as far as being able to cut this apart and fully weld that inner structure, which is something that usually gets kind of overlooked with most chops. So um, I had fun making this piece and I hope you guys enjoyed the video on using hand tools only to make shapes. And uh, we're gonna get right to film in the next one where we do the exact same thing with the other side. We're gonna finish it with a couple other metal shaping tools and then we're gonna weld these in and weld that inner structure. So thank you everybody. Don't forget to like, click subscribe for more content just like this where you're learning and using hand tools. And uh, if you wanna help make it custom out a little bit, you can do the $5 a month subscription to be part of the custom crew. You get a badge by your name and you get 15% off at the merch store. Uh, don't forget Mother Tucker Hammers. They are free shipping for uh, US and Canada right now. Um, they're on the website ready to ship. So yeah, check them out, japanscustoms.com. Thanks a lot, everybody. And don't forget to check out Ray Shaleen, Pro Shaper Workshop. I learned stuff from that guy.